Hello, and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today, I'll be talking about Season 7, Episode 4, The Wink. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well out there. I am doing much better. I was under the weather for an annoyingly long time. (laughs) All told, maybe six or seven full days of just feeling not great. I just kind of break down when I'm sick. Well, you know what? Actually, I take that back. I, I usually power through when I'm sick, but this was the first time I was sort of like, I can't even, like, I need to just be laying down, which caused um, another <laughs> issue, <laughs> adding insult to injury. I like tweaked out my neck because I think I was just laying down like way too much. I have a bad neck too. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. That's a whole separate podcast. But I definitely maybe just cuz I was sleeping a lot and laying down a lot, I something was funky in the way I was uh, laying down or perhaps fell asleep and my neck. I don't know if it was a pinched nerve or just some kind of weird muscle thing. I don't speak neck, guys. I don't know. But all I know (laughs) was my neck was jacked up for the entirety of my illness, which just made it so much worse when you can't like, when you're super stiff and you can't even turn like your neck. It was, it was bad. Um, So anyway, I did not have the best week. And it happened to be my birthday week, (laughs) which... I was like, what a great way to ring in the next year of my life. Oh well, I'm not that I'm not that precious about birthdays, so it's totally fine, but it, it you know, even if you're not that precious about it like me, I still want to do something like I might may have wanted to go out to dinner or done a little fun shopping trip or something, but no, I just kind of had to lay around with my illness and my stupid neck and sweating and having chills and just all the fun stuff. But I got a lot of lovely cards uh, from my family and they tried their best to make it as as pleasant as possible while also keeping their distance because I'm like, I don't want you to get sick because I'm bracing right now actually for the inevitability of a family member, well, mainly my kids getting sick, catching whatever I had. And then I spend my first few like feeling good, healthy days taking care of them. And it's my job. I'm their mom. I get it. But (laughs) I'm also selfish. And I just want to get back to my regular life uh, without any illness anywhere to be seen. But we're entering that season. It's um, COVID's on the uptick, the flu season's coming up. And from what I understand, it's going to be the worst flu season of all time. So that's just super fun. But anyway, enough about my health uh, or lack of health for the last week. But um, I'm feeling better. Um, Still, it's like, you know, just some of those annoying last symptoms that just stick around for a while. But I mean, compared to where I was a week ago today, it's much better. Okay, so let's get into this episode. The synopsis for The Wink is as follows. Elaine gets a blind date with the guy from her wake-up service. However, he likes dogs. A bit of grapefruit pulp from Jerry's healthy breakfast gets into George's eye and causes problems for him when his winks keep getting misinterpreted. Jerry's healthy diet conflicts with his dating of Elaine's cousin. Kramer promises a sick boy that Yankee Paul O'Neill will hit two home runs for him so he can get back a birthday card that he sold based on George's wink. This episode was written by Tom Gamble and Max Pross. So this is the first episode of season seven that is not written by Larry David. And I can tell, but I'll get into that later. (laughs) All right, we open on a scene from Elaine's bedroom. She's in bed and uh, her phone's ringing. It's her wake-up service guy calling her at 7.15. She could use a few more hours sleep. (sighs) Hot date last night. (laughs) She's amused by that. I wish. Her wake-up guy says, a woman with a sexy voice like yours. Hard to believe you're waking up alone. 
Well, Elaine perks up immediately. Really? Thank you, Tri-State Wake-Up Service person. Call me James. Oh, all right. James. Uh, My take on this scene... I love when an episode starts with solo Elaine. (laughs) It's great. (laughs) I think the last time was episode one from the season where she's yelling at the dog. Uh, This is a cute scene. That moment where she pops up at his compliment always gets me. I (laughs) I love that she's just, she's still groggy and like stretching and oh, she's just, uh, she wants to sleep some more. And then he gives her that compliment, got a sexy voice and she's like, what? (laughs) Um, And then I love that she leans into her sexy voice. It's great. Once again, desperate Elaine on full display, but I'm here for it. All right, next, we are in Monks. George is fascinated by this. He's asking Elaine, your wake-up guy asked you out? And Elaine explains how she feels sort of this weird, intimate relationship with him. I mean, whenever they talk, she's laying in bed, wearing her nightie. Jerry is skeptical, a blind date. Elaine points out how he's going out with her cousin Holly and he's never met her. Well, I've seen pictures, he says. And she points out, well, at least I've spoken to my guy. You're going on a deaf date. And then Jerry asks, would you rather date the deaf or the blind? Oh, see, now you're off on a topic. Now, Jerry would rather date the deaf. You know, the blind would be a bit messy around the house, not going to get all the crumbs. George disagrees. He'd rather date the blind. You know, you can let yourself go. A good looking blind woman really doesn't know you're not good enough for her. And Elaine says, I think she'd figure it out soon enough. The waitress arrives with Jerry's food. Elaine's like, what is this? A veggie sandwich and a grapefruit? What are you turning into? A healthy person. And Jerry digs into his grapefruit and accidentally squirts George in the eye with the juice. My take on this scene, I love that Elaine says nighty. It just brings back memories of my childhood. Are there nighties anymore? Like right now, can you go online? Well, of course you can go online and buy anything, but I just, you know, you don't find sections of nighties at stores anymore. But that when I was growing up, that was literally... I had a drawer full of 90s. <laughs> um, it was exclusive to my pajamas wardrobe, 90s only. And, um, you know, we might be, we, we've evolved into a new hair era for Elaine. You know, she doesn't have the big wall of hair anymore. But unfortunately, <laughs> we're still in her Amish looking 90 phase, which I don't know if, it, if that ever changes. I think that stays true until geez, 1998 when the series ends, which I don't think tracks for the Elaine character. Can we evolve her nighty situation? <laughs> Can she just maybe wear um, still classy, some some classy pajamas, but it does it have to be a nighty? Um, oh, wait, now like now there's an image of her, I think in, I think in some satin pajamas. Okay. Anyway, um, this is not important at this moment. We'll get to it. We'll get to the satin pajamas later if she is wearing it. But I think, I think I am wrong about the nighty, the nighties making it to the end of the series. All right, moving on um, (laughs) in my comments, um, I would have loved to hear which Elaine would have liked to date, the deaf or the blind. And and let's not forget also, Jerry brings this up as if he's never had the option. Hello, he dated a deaf lineswoman a few seasons ago. (laughs) Sometimes, I don't know, sometimes those little things annoy me where it's like, you know, maybe in the writer's room, they didn't even think about it, which is like, this is your job. Like, you shouldn't forget that the main character, like you're making this whole bit, you're writing it out. It's like, well, Jerry already dated the deaf. So could we at least mention it? Because the fans are going to remember, especially psycho fans like me. But anyway, yeah, I would have loved to hear what would Elaine prefer. But of course, we just don't get her answer at all. But her retort to George is wonderful. (laughs) I think she'd figure it out soon enough. (laughs) And yeah, I think a blind person, all their other senses are heightened. So yeah, George, she's going to figure it out that you've let yourself go. You've let the entire apartment go, whatever. (laughs) And me personally... We didn't get to hear Elaine's answer, but you all can hear my answer. I think I'd rather date the deaf. No offense to my husband, even though this is offensive, but sometimes I feel like I'm dating the deaf. Am I right, ladies? My husband maybe hears 60% of anything I say. I'm like, I just have to repeat myself so much in my house. (laughs) 
And I handle it really well, you guys. I never snap. I never lose my temper. I am so calm about it. I mean, I'm really patient, super patient. I think the main reason, though, I'd love to date the deaf is because I really want to communicate through sign language. I think there's something so elegant about it. Whenever there's a an ASL interpreter uh, at some event or, you know, they're like on TV, if someone's giving a speech and you see that, I am so distracted by that person because I just, I don't know, there's something very performative about it. Big surprise. I'm an actor, so I love to perform. <laughs> but they're just like the elegance with the hands, I just think it's beautiful. So I don't know. I don't think with the blind, I would you know, it's not like I'm going to learn Braille. I don't know. Anyway, um, so deaf, the deaf for me, that's my dating choice. All right, next we're in George's office. George is still messing with his eye. It's still bothering him. When Wilhelm walks in and asks about Morgan, George says he hasn't seen him. Oh, he's been coming in later and later. Is there something wrong? George says, no, not that he knows of. And then he winks. And Wilhelm takes this as a signal. Really? Anyway, he's got this envelope and tells George to make sure Morgan signs it. And, you know, feel free to tell me if there's any issue with Morgan. No, George says he's doing a great job and winks again. I understand, Wilhelm says and exits. Next, we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry still can't believe Elaine is going on a blind date. She says, you know, I'm not worried. He sounds really good looking. What are we, whales? We're going by sound? (laughs) She says, I think I can tell. Elaine, what percentage of people do you think are good looking? 25%? Oh, Jerry vehemently disagrees. He thinks it's 4 to 6%. Oh, you're way off, she says. Have you been down to the Motor Vehicle Bureau lately? It's a leper colony down there. <laughs> George enters and goes to the fridge. Elaine says, so you're saying that 95% of the population is undateable? Undateable! How are all these people getting together? Alcohol is Jerry's answer. And Elaine notices George and says, what's your problem? No problem here, he says. Wink. You keep winking at me. That's really obnoxious. I had no idea. Wink. Right there. You did it again. Then George realizes it must have been from the grapefruit juice. Oh, your eye still hurts? Yeah, you must have squirted a piece of pulp in there, too. Pulp couldn't make it across the table, Jerry says. Oh, Pulp can move, baby, yells at Jerry. Why can't you eat a real breakfast? (laughs) Jerry's like, hey, if I eat healthy and take out an eye, that's the breaks. Oh, George realizes he must have been winking down at the office. That's why Mr. Wilhelm was acting so mysterioso. What do you think? You were flirting with him? Elaine's so amused by this. No, he thought I was hiding something about Morgan. Kramer enters and Jerry says, hey, Jughead. Kramer yes ands this and says, Archie to Jerry and hello, Veronica to Elaine and Mr. Weatherby to George. (laughs) Then Kramer spots the envelope that George brought and recognizes some of the Yankee signatures. And George is like, yeah, it's an inner office envelope. It gets passed around. And he asks him, well, can I show this to my buddy Stubbs? He sells sports memorabilia. He paid top dollar for autographs. Yeah, like I'm going to risk my job with the New York Yankees to make a few extra bucks. Wink. No, of course not, Kramer says, and he winks himself. All right, my take on this scene. Now, of course, this scene contains one of the most iconic moments in the series, Jerry and Elaine's conversation about percentage of good-looking people. And I love it. It is such a well-written um, exchange. I think it's really funny. I will admit, too, that this part of the scene makes me crave those snack wall cookies. I mean, crave is is a strong term, probably. Um, I remember we did have those in the house around this time where when this episode came out. I mean, it was a thing. It, it was like this kind of this movement. Oh, healthy cookies are not bad for you. They look amazing. They're like sandwich cookies, like Oreos. And again, it's super weird that I have a craving for them because I think I just want to try them again to see how bad they were because they were not good. I remember them being in our pantry and I think they were in our pantry for like a year because no one ate them. Yeah, they weren't good. They were very, just like all the health foods for so long, just cardboardy, 
you know, not a lot of flavor. There was, there just was, it there just didn't have that richness and sweetness that you needed from your cookies. So yeah, no surprise. I actually did <laughs> when I was making my notes for this episode while uh, sweating and having chills. I, um, I did look them up. It looks like the devil's food cake one is still available. You can like buy it online, but the ones that Jerry and Elaine are eating and the ones that I know that we had in my house growing up, they're like the sandwich cookie ones. And um, those were nowhere to be found, but I think they're definitely discontinued. Wow. Elaine is so mad at George when she thinks he's deliberately winking. It's really aggressive. I, I, I find it amusing. I'm not saying it's bad, but I just love how she's like, that's really obnoxious. Like, there, you did it again. <laughs> now, I, that's amusing, but I, I really don't love the whole winking plot. There's... Look, I know I'm doing the the annoying thing where you analyze it too much and you're just supposed to accept some things. (laughs) What did our wonderful guest, Nancy Hayden, say? Um, Shark tornado shit. I'm gonna have to look that up. But basically, you know, the concept of like you're watching something that you're not supposed to get so deep into and just accept it. But the whole idea of this winking plot, it's so far-fetched to me because there's no way George wouldn't like feel that he's winking. Like it's, again, it's not like a really quick wink or like a rapid wink that you would think would have. It's like a very deliberate, slow wink. But for the sake of the comedy in this episode, I forgive it, but I don't love it. And lastly, for this scene, I love the Archie Comics reference. I used to collect Archie Comics like so I was obsessed, obsessed with Archie growing up. And I remember when I first saw this episode, I was so incredibly delighted by this little exchange because all it's all it's all accurate. Um for the I mean, I'm sorry if you're not familiar, but Kramer is a perfect jughead. Totally makes sense for Jerry to be Archie. Veronica, yes, the beautiful brunette <laughs> for Elaine. And Mr. Weatherby was their portly principal who wore glasses and was bald. (laughs) So absolutely perfect for George. All right, next we are at the Collector's Universe store and Kramer is talking up this envelope to his buddy. You know, he points out the different signatures. Now, his buddy Stubbs isn't too impressed. He's like, an envelope doesn't really cut it. Then he looks inside his own birthday card signed by the entire Yankee organization this could be worth something. We got a Gilmore Girls Seinfeld connection. The actor who plays Stubbs, Ian Patrick Williams, also played Professor Quincy in the Go Bulldogs episode of Gilmore Girls. And this is the episode where Lorelai and Christopher attend Parents Weekend. Uh, this is after they get together. This is the last season of Gilmore Girls, which was not a great season because Amy Sherman Palladino and Daniel Palladino were not into, they were not involved anymore. Okay, I don't have to get into that, but those of you who know, you know. Anyway, at the parents' weekend, Christopher is super into it, and they go they go to a lecture. He and Lorelai, and this professor Quincy, um, he really engages with them because he really wants to learn what the professor is talking about. And side note, Lorelai, this is the episode where I think Lorelai is at peak annoying in this series, but that's a whole other podcast. All right, next we're in George's office. We hear George greet the lovely Mrs. Morgan. Morgan asks about the birthday card, and George is confused. Steinbrenner's birthday card. Wilhelm gave it to you for me to sign. Oh, George realizes he needs to go get it from Jerry's place, and he says, I'll have it to you after lunch. He says, fine, I'll be back after my massage. Of course, your massage. Wink. Enjoy your massage. Well, Mrs. Morgan notices that wink and storms out past Mr. Morgan. Now, okay, the actress who plays Mrs. Morgan... I have no idea who she is because (laughs) there is no record of who this woman is. She's not even listed in the credits at the end of the episode. Nowhere to be found in the IMDb page. And I was just, I don't know, it just, I could have just let it go. Like, okay, I don't know. They just didn't credit this actress, but it kind of got under my skin. I'm like, they credit everyone. I mean, she's, she plays an actual role. So I, I just found it odd. So I Googled it and I found a Reddit thread asking the same question, like, who is this woman who plays Mrs. Morgan? I cannot seem to find her credit anywhere. 
And I came upon some interesting theories. So many people on the thread thought that this actress was actually a white actress in blackface. Um, Now, many others also disputed this and they said, no, I think this is a black actress, but she's just uncredited. But no, there were like quite a few. They're like, "Uh, no, like she, (laughs) this woman has always looked a little bit off to me. And we think Jerry and Larry scrubbed all record of this actress because it's so politically incorrect, you know, to do this. But like, anyway, yeah, she, they think it's a white actress in blackface. Now, the people who were talking about, no, it's probably a black actress who they just didn't credit. Now, the theory there, which I, I think I tend to believe this more. I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to start a whole conspiracy theory about who Mrs. Morgan is. But I, I don't want to get too technical here. But if you are an extra or like a background actor in a show, they don't credit you. You know, obviously, they, at the end of the shows, they don't they don't list all of the extras. Now, She's not necessarily in the background, but she also doesn't have any dialogue that we see her say on screen. Now, we hear the hello from Mrs. Morgan, but we don't see her say it on camera. We are actually still seeing the exterior of Yankee Stadium when we hear a voice, a woman's voice say, hello. So if that's the case and she's just maybe an extra or someone they just pulled and um, you don't see her say any dialogue on screen, technically that's that's an extra. So they don't have to credit that person. So I don't know, to me, that might be a little bit more feasible because also that's done on television as well, because then they don't have to pay that person like a, a, a day rate. They can p- pay them the extra rate, which is much cheaper. <laughs> so it's in their best interest to be like, hey, let's just dub someone else's voice in for this person that we see. And we don't see them saying a dialogue because if they say a line of dialogue, on screen, that's a whole different pay grade for that actor. So anyway, I think that's more feasible here. But man, there were quite a few people who think this blackface theory is what is going on here. Uh, Like I said, either or, there's no way to know. So I'm not going to pontificate on that any longer. Anyway, I don't know who this woman is, but I think she's perfectly fine. And she does a good job with her expression, that little suspicious turn that she does when the wink (laughs) happens. The wink that, I mean, George should be able to feel, but I'm not going to harp on that. All right, moving on, we are now at Monk's and Elaine is sitting at a table waiting for her blind date. And a man walks in and he seems to be looking around as well. Elaine says, hello, Elaine. James! Ooh, Elaine is relieved and does a little motion across her forehead like, yes, <laughs> I am so relieved now that this person is very good looking. Uh, my take on this scene, quite the relief. Yes, I, uh, I'm i with Elaine. James is very cute. And it's a cute JLD performance here. Love that little swipe across the forehead. All right, next we are at a steakhouse. Jerry's on his date with Holly, and she can't believe Elaine has never taken him there before. He says, well, I'm not much of a meat eater. Oh, are you one of those? Well, I'm not one of those. She tells him how when they were little, their grandma Mima used to take them to a matinee and then dinner here. Mima? Elaine must have mentioned Mima. No, I think I'd remember Mima. I'm not surprised, Holly says. Elaine never liked Mima. A waiter arrives and Holly orders a steak with a baked potato. Jerry asks, you know, what he recommends besides a steak? He says the lamb chops are good. Anything lighter? How do you prepare the chicken? Well, it's a full bird stuffed with ham and topped with gorgonzola. (laughs) (laughs) Jerry doesn't like the sound of that either, so he decides to order just a salad. Yikes. The waiter and Holly give (laughs) some judgmental looks, and the order echoes in Jerry's head. Just a salad. Just a salad. The actress here who plays Holly is Stacy Travis, and she has appeared in Modern Family, Easy A, Desperate Housewives, among others. This is tough because I hate this character. (laughs) I cannot stand Holly at all. She just doesn't fit at all. Like nothing about her fits in this episode. But I think Stacey Travis plays her just right. That sort of smug and annoying traditionalist, like the literally the meat and potatoes type. 
who probably would have this super annoying opinion like men can eat salad. Get over yourself, Holly. All right, next we are on the street. James greets his dogs. They're tied to a parking meter. Oh, are these your dogs? Elaine asks. He says, yeah, you know, when you live alone, your dogs are all you have. He asks Elaine, do you like dogs? We see Elaine flashback to screaming at the dog in her courtyard. Shut up, you stupid mutt. Now back to the present, she lies and says, oh, I, I, I love dogs. And so he introduces them. Boys, this is Elaine. And they start barking at her violently. <laughs> James apologizes. You, they're usually really friendly. My take on this scene, I, I do love this callback to the premiere of the season. Honestly, James seems like he'd be a better match with Holly. Just kind of the look. Just like a basic dude, you know, and Holly's pretty basic. And I bet he would order the biggest steak at <laughs> that steakhouse. All right, next we are in George's office. George greets Morgan again. How was your massage? Oh, I had to cancel. He's like, somehow my wife thought it was more than a massage. So they got in a big fight. He says, I'll be sleeping on the couch tonight. And George says, hey, don't oversleep. You can't afford to be late again. I know, Morgan says. Someone's been telling Wilhelm I've been slacking off on the job. And then George thinks about Elaine's wake-up service and gives him the card. Thanks, Costanza. He says, you might be my only friend around here. And he asks about the envelope. Uh, George says, not yet. I don't have it. Well, make sure Mr. Steinbrenner doesn't get it before I sign it. And George says, yes, sir. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry and Elaine are playing Scrabble, and she's telling him about James's dogs growling at her. And he's like, well, maybe they heard about you trying to kidnap that other dog. These mutts like to gossip. Great line. And then he asks, hey, wait, have you talked to Holly? Uh-huh. Well, did she say anything about our lunch? Uh, kind of. Well, what do you mean? Well, Elaine explains, well, she thought it was kind of strange for a man to just order a salad. And he says, oh, the quiche thing? Yeah, that's in the ballpark. He's like, what was I thinking? Women don't respect salad eaters. And Elaine's like, no, we don't. And Jerry mentions, oh, you're going over there for dinner. What is she making? Elaine says, I don't know, but I'm sure it had parents. Elaine says to call her up. You know, she won't mind if you come. Oh, I will, he says, and I'll be packing an artery. Uh, my take on this scene, I don't think this will be surprising to any of you, <laughs> but this whole thing is so annoying. Men can't eat salads. I just find if that's the whole premise they want to go with in this weak ass plot, I just think as a salad eater herself, a big, excuse me, a big salad eater, Elaine agreeing with that whole thing that women don't respect salad eaters is kind of stupid. Like, I don't think she'd be totally on board with this. Like the whole real men eat meat. Like, what? <laughs> and look, I, I suppose I'm a bit biased because I grew up around a lot of vegetarian men as a Hindu person. That's very common. And also, I just don't think it tracks that Jerry would lean into this. Like, and for Holly, like the most basic bitch. <laughs> I'm sorry. Come on, Jerry. This is just a really weak plot, and I just don't think it tracks with these characters. Also, I wanted to explain it because I never I never understood it. So this is for all of you out there who were like me. That whole comment about, oh, the quiche thing, that actually refers to a book called Real Men Don't Eat Quiche by Bruce Firestein. And it was uh, published in like 1982. And it's a, it's a book, it's a tongue-in-cheek look at contemporary masculinity. So it's like totally satire. It's not real. <laughs> not really saying that um, real men don't eat quiche. So I won't dump on that book. But this whole plot is annoying to me. And I just, it's just not true to the characters, like I said. Because since when does Jerry care about being super masculine? It just, ugh, it just, I don't, I just do not enjoy it at all. All right, next, we are at Kramer's door. George knocks and asks if Kramer has that envelope. And Kramer gives it to him and says he'll be very pleased with what's inside. George takes out some money. What is this? Your cut of the loot, he says. Stubbs gave me $200 for the card inside. George is in a panic. Who told you to sell the card? You did. And he does a little wink. Ugh, I wasn't winking. <laughs> it's the grapefruit. It's like acid. Tells Kramer, I, I need that card. He was responsible for it. Kramer says, well, Stubbs already sold it to some guy whose kid's in the hospital. He says, well, get it back. It's very important. Wink. Now, do you want me to get it back or not? <laughs> and George pries his eyes open. Get it back. 
All right, next we are at Holly's apartment. Elaine is complimenting Holly on the table setting, and ooh, she loves the napkins. Oh, they were Grandma Mima's. Elaine says she doesn't remember them. Oh, you wouldn't. She only brought them out for special occasions. And she goes into the kitchen. Elaine says to Jerry, special occasions? It wasn't special when my family came over. Holly returns with the platter. Everybody like mutton? Jerry goes totally over the top. Oh, mutton. Hope you didn't cut the fat off. (laughs) Uh, My take on this scene. I hate Holly. Just hate her. This character brings out the worst in everyone. I'm so glad she never comes back. (laughs) This is a one and done. Also, she sort of comes out of nowhere, which is not my favorite either. Like, we've never heard about fucking Holly, like Elaine's cousin that lives in the city. Everything about this Holly plot with Jerry and Elaine just seems really forced and just not that funny. All right, next we're in the hospital. Kramer enters a kid's hospital room. His name's Bobby. He asks about a card that he got. And uh, Bobby shows him. It's in a frame and he's so excited about it. And Kramer tells him that, you know, he needs the card back. It's very important for a friend of his. Oh, no, Bobby says. I wouldn't part with this card for anything in the world. Kramer has to think of something else. He asks about his favorite Yankee, who turns out to be Paul O'Neill. And he says, well, what if Paul O'Neill hit a home run for you? For me? Could he hit two? (laughs) Uh, Two? Kramer's like, well, sure, but you've got to promise me something. I know. Get out of this bed one day and walk again. Yeah, that'd be great, but I just really need the card. All right, next we're back at Holly's apartment. Everyone's just chewing on that mutton. Elaine asks about the candelabra in the middle of the table. And, oh, yeah, that was Grandma Mima's as well. While she's talking about Grandma Mima, we see Jerry spitting out the mutton in his napkin. And Holly says to Jerry, she's thrilled he likes her mutton. I was afraid you only ate salads. Ah, Salad's got nothing on this mutton. Did you just make that up, she asks. (laughs) Jerry wishes he could take the credit for it. Something he and his butcher say when they're chewing the fat. Then he asks about the... Beautiful desk over there. (laughs) Elaine whips her head around. Oh, yeah, that was Grandma Mimis, too. Oh, Elaine's like, I love that desk. Would you ransack the place when she died? And Jerry keeps laying it on thick. This is some fine mutton. Well, Elaine wants to get out of there. She needs to borrow Jerry's jacket. She didn't bring hers, and it's cold out. And he hesitates, of course, because that's where he's been spitting out all of his mutton. So they play a bit of tug of war, and he finally lets her have it. Elaine says, God forbid I should borrow one from Holly. Probably belong to Grandma Mima. Thanks for mutton. And she leaves. There's a quick scene of Elaine trying to walk home, but there are some dogs crowding around her as she walks, and she's trying to be nice to them. (laughs) Nice doggy. Don't believe everything you hear. Back at Holly's, Jerry and Holly are clearing the table, and she notices that two of the napkins are missing. (gasps) Elaine must have took them. And he's like, I don't know about that. Have you got any floss? You heard her, Holly says. She coveted them. She probably took them to spite me. I bet she's having a good laugh about it right now. But what instead is happening is Elaine is running down the street trying to escape a pack of dogs. Uh, My take on this scene, JLD gets some funny moments in this scene. The thanks for mutton thing is mildly amusing. I just hate this stupid plot so much that I don't have much to say. And Holly's still stupid. All right, next we are in James' apartment. Elaine rushes in. Elaine, what are you doing in this neighborhood, he asks. And she asks, did you hide the dogs? Yeah, 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 they're in the kitchen. And we hear them barking. Elaine gets so scared. James yells at them to be quiet and he asks her, what's going on? And Elaine says, these dogs were chasing me. No cabs were stopping. She had to get off the street and she remembered that he lived here. Why were dogs chasing you, he asks. I don't know. They just don't like me, okay? It's a long story. I don't have time to tell you now, but I'll tell it to you someday. And he's like, well, I'd ask for you to stay, but I only have the fold-out couch, and that's where I sleep. Elaine contemplates this and says, well, we'll just have to sleep head to toe. Head to toe? Head to toe. And then there's a break in the episode, but we continue back in this same apartment. It's the next morning, and we see Elaine and James on the couch, head to toe, like she said, And her feet are all up in his face. (laughs) She wakes up and she's overslept. It's 8.30. She kicks him in the face to wake him up. You were supposed to wake me up at 7.15. He says, sorry, he couldn't sleep. She kept kicking him in the face all night. She says, you're a wake up guy. Don't you have calls to make? I'll make them later, he says. And we see the list of his calls that Morgan is on for 6.30 a.m. And then we cut to Morgan fast asleep on his couch. 
All right, my take on this scene, it's a funny scene for JLD. I love the desperation here with James when she first arrives at his apartment. Uh, the head to toe moment's very funny. And just a side note, I love that James is such a gentleman. <laughs> he doesn't presume anything. He's not Watley with the one bed, you know, at the Super Bowl. He's just like, I don't know what to do here. Oh, my God. And then the Elaine, just her feet in his face is so funny. And the way she kicks him, I mean, oh, she's such a brat, but I love it. All right, next, we are in George's office. Wilhelm asks George, where's Morgan? He's not here? No, he's late again. George says, that's impossible. I got him a wake-up service. He says, you know what, George? You don't have to cover for him. You know, he's going to be gone soon, and I'm going to recommend you for the job. Gone, George says. All right, next, we're in Monk's. <laughs> And Jerry's like, well, all that winking got you a promotion. George doesn't want Morgan's job. He's got a lot of work to do. Elaine arrives and George is so mad. Hey, your friend never woke up Mr. Morgan. Yeah, well, he was tired. He had some feet in his face. <laughs> Tells Jerry how Holly has gone insane. She keeps calling me and accusing me of stealing her napkins. Why? Why would I take her napkins? So Jerry comes clean and explains what happened with the mutton and how the napkins were in the jacket pocket. And Elaine's like... Oh, that's why the dogs were chasing her. I was almost mauled because of that mutton. What is mutton anyway? <laughs> George wants to know. Jerry's like, I don't know, and I don't want to find out. Apparently, it's lamb or goat meat. Mutton, ironically, actually is the red meat used in India for those people who are not vegetarian. So like if you go to a McDonald's in India, uh, you get like, I believe you get like mutton burgers. You don't get beef burgers because the cow is sacred, of course. Um, all right, back to the scene. Jerry's wondering where his jacket is. Oh, I must have left it at James's. Oh, spent the night at James's, did we? She's like, yeah, but we reversed positions, so there was no funny business. Reversed positions? Yeah, you know, head to toe. But your genitals are still lined up. No, 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 no. I slept with my back to him. And they all do what they call themselves the blowfish look, the little mm -hmm, pursed lips. All right, my take on this scene, um, it's probably the best scene of the episode. I love the conversation about the head-to-toe sleeping. Super funny. I mean, I think Elaine could figure out that the back to James head-to-toe wouldn't totally prevent funny business, but whatever, I forgive it. I don't, I, I've said this before, I don't like it when Elaine's kind of the idiot in the scene, but at the same time, she's allowed to be. I, I also don't believe in coddling the women characters either. Like, no, we can't make them look bad at all. So anyway, I think also she's got more pressing issues like her dumbass cousin Holly accusing her of stealing her napkins. So she's not, she's not thinking about, you know, um, whatever, butt sex or whatever, the, whatever the implication is about <laughs> sleeping with her back to him. Uh, that realization moment of why the dogs were chasing her is really well done by JLD. Uh, and it's just, again, this is another example. Elaine suffering at the hands of these idiot friends of hers. All right, next we are at Yankee Stadium. Kramer approaches Paul O'Neill in the locker room and he says he needs a favor. And Paul's like, well, I can't really give you an autograph. My pen's messed up. No, no, no. He says, I, I want you to do something to lift a kid in the hospital, lift his spirits. Oh, sure. I can help you with that, he says. All right. You got to hit two home runs, a couple dingers. Paul O'Neill clarifies, wait, wait, what? Two home runs? You want me to hit two home runs? What? No good? Yeah, it's no good. It's terrible. It's hard to hit home runs. And where'd you get two from? Well, two is better than one, Kramer says. Well, and he's like, it's ridiculous. I'm not a home run hitter. Uh, Babe Ruth did it. He did not. <laughs> Are you calling Babe Ruth a liar? He's not calling him a liar, but he wasn't stupid enough to promise two. Kramer realizes maybe I did overextend myself. Paul O'Neill's like, how the heck did you get in here anyway? Um, I know there's no Elaine in this scene, but I, this is such a great scene. It's so good. Now, I am like I, I couldn't be less of a fan of baseball. So I have no knowledge of baseball players. So for years, I didn't think this was a real baseball player. This Paul O'Neill, it, it's, it is really Paul O'Neill for those of you like me who don't know baseball players. And let's face it, most of the time athletes or non-actors are terrible actors, you know, like when they go on shows and there it's like a big thrill, like as a guest star or something. Um, may I refer you to the Michael Jordan SNL episode? But anyway, as a general rule, it kind of stands out what bad actors they are. But <laughs> again, for years, I didn't know that Paul O'Neill was a real baseball player and that this guy was actually a Yankee. Like, because he's so funny. He's so 
natural in this scene. He doesn't seem uncomfortable. His delivery, his timing. I mean, it is really well done, like on par with a comedic actor. And he's great, like toe to toe with Kramer, like, or sorry, Michael Richards, I guess. Like, it's just, it's so well done. And I just have to shout out <laughs> what a great actor Paul O'Neill is. Bravo. I could have brought him back, I think. All right, next we're at James's apartment. He's on the phone with Elaine. <laughs> you know, I lost all my 630 clients because of you. Why'd you have to stick your feet in my face? And he says, yes, yes, I have the jacket. So he walks over to the couch where his dogs are all over Jerry's jacket. Fellas. And then he finds the napkins. All right, next we are kind of hopping back and forth between the hospital and Jerry's apartment. Kramer and Bobby are watching the game and Kramer asks, can I have some of your juice, Bobby? And he moves it out of his reach after Paul O'Neill hits his first home run. We cut to Jerry's apartment. He's watching the same Yankees game and then Holly buzzes. And we hear from the TV that Paul O'Neill has had a hit. And then we cut back to the hospital and yes, it's a home run. And Kramer, <laughs> Kramer grabs the juice and Bobby exclaims, one more to go. Uh-oh. All right, back to Jerry's. Uh, Holly walks in with a bag of groceries. She's going to cook dinner. Well, I thought we were going out. And she's like, well, you loved my mutton so much. I had the urge to cook pork chops for you. She also tells him that she said hello to Franco. Who? Your butcher down the street. Oh, yeah. Jerry's like, I bet he acted all aloof like he didn't know me. A little. <laughs> that is so Franco. All right, back to the hospital. Paul O'Neill is at bat again. Kramer tries to explain to Bobby, you know, it's very hard to hit two home runs, even for Paul O'Neill. He can do it, Mr. Kramer. I know he can. He'll do it for me. He hits a fly ball and just keeps on going, and it's an inside-the-park home run. So Kramer goes to grab the card, but then we hear on the TV that there was a throwing error, so instead it's a triple to Paul O'Neill. Hey, that's not a home run. Kramer's like, come on, Bobby, that's just as good. <laughs> You're not getting this card. And they start having a tug of war fight over the card. All right, then back at Jerry's. Jerry's eating the pork chop. Holly asks, is it the way you like it? He's like, well, I usually like it with an angioplasty. Holly turns away and we see Jerry spitting out the meat, his old standby, <laughs> into a napkin and stuffing it into the sofa. Elaine enters. Oh, something really stinks to hi. Holly, what are you doing here? Jerry's like, what everyone does here, cooking pork chops. Elaine tells Jerry, I'm meeting James here. He's bringing your jacket. What about the napkins? Holly says, oh, I didn't take your napkins. Then who did? Elaine's like, ask Jerry. Just throws him under the bus. And then Jerry's like, hey, you know, it doesn't matter in this modern world. It just doesn't seem relevant who took the napkins. Uh, not much to say, you know, Elaine comes in towards the end of this series of scenes. I do like the whole stinks to hi, Holly. <laughs> All right, next we are in George's office. Wilhelm is wondering where Steinbrenner's card went. He asks Morgan if he ever signed it. And he says, no, George never gave it to me. Oh, George is about to confess, says, you know, I take complete responsibility. But then Kramer enters and he's like, I got the card. He presents it in the frame and he mentions to George, by the way, tomorrow night, Paul O'Neill needs to catch a fly ball in his hat. Oh, Wilhelm is so pleased how beautiful it is. George, why didn't you tell me you were going to mount it like this? Kramer's like, you're probably just going to put it in an envelope. Wilhelm shakes his head, keep up the good work and exits. Morgan's just sitting there laughing sarcastically. Well, you screwed me again, Costanza. How am I supposed to sign the card now? It's already under glass. And George just looks at him apologetically. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Elaine opens the door for James, who enters with his dogs. Holly freaks out. Excuse me, what are those dogs wearing? Oh, bandanas. Aren't they cute? Well, of course, they're not bandanas. They're Mima's <laughs> napkins. <laughs> Holly's like... You gave Mima's napkins to some dogs? Jerry's looking at his jacket. What happened? James says, oh, the dogs did that, but it wasn't their fault. Someone stuck some strange meat in the pockets. <gasps> Holly asks, was it mutton? Could have been. We see the dogs jump on the couch, and <laughs> Holly asks Jerry if he always stuffs meat in his pockets. And we see the dogs are rifling through all of the pork chops in the couch, and he says, no, sometimes I use a sofa. Uh, there's a tag to the episode where George enters Steinbrenner's office and Steinbrenner thanks him for the card. And he's like, oh, it was not just me, the whole organization, especially Mr. Morgan. Well, Steinbrenner notices that uh, 
Morgan's signature is missing from the card. And he's like, decides, eh, I'm, I'm done with him and congratulates George. You've got his job. It's a lot more work, more responsibility, long hours, not much more money. He goes on and on about who he's fired over the years and George walks out. All right, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. Oh, hello. I'm Mema. So nice to be talking to you. I am doing this advertisement because I think you'll really enjoy something I have to offer. Since I retired 25 years ago, I found myself not quite ready for the life of leisure. The only part I enjoyed about retirement was not having to wear the restrictive office wardrobe forced upon me for so many years, which is why I started Mima's Moomoo's. A moo allows all of your bits and pieces to wiggle and jiggle as nature intended, with prints so loud even a deaf person could hear them. Each Mima's Moomoo is handcrafted by yours truly from the finest cotton I can find at the Baltimore Fabric Emporium. With over 600 prints to choose from, you will most likely find a Moomoo that fits your taste. To order a Mima's Moomoo, just visit www.hollyismyfavorite.com fuck Elaine and start shopping. As a thank you from me, every order will also receive a free gift from my house. From candelabras to cloth napkins, there's plenty to choose from. I've never thrown anything away. Mima's Moomoo's. Envelop your body shame with style. And we're back. There were just a couple of things in the notes about nothing that I wanted to mention. JLD came up with the thanks for mutton line herself. I think it was originally thanks for the mutton, but then she came up with on the day, thanks for mutton, which I think is better. Good job, JLD. And apparently (laughs) foot fetishists love the scene where Elaine has her feet in James's space. I don't want to know any more details about that, (laughs) but that was literally in the notes about nothing, (laughs) that foot fetishists revered that scene. Hey man, if it's your thing, it's your thing. No judgment. All right, now it's time to open Greg's sack lunch. Our most dedicated contributor, Greg, sends us his thoughts about the episode in a tidy sack every week. To start out, I see in his sack Greg's overall thoughts. He says, Before I share my sack, lunch, with the world, I have to acknowledge that our hostess with the mostest, Shivani, (laughs) had a birthday this week. Hopefully she had some cake that was as good as the Duke and Duchess of Windsor's cake and not just ring dings and Pepsi. Shivani is our most dedicated contributor given that this is her podcast. Aw, thanks, Greg. That's so sweet. Um, For those of you who may not know, I do not read Greg's sack lunch thoughts until... I am recording. I put it in my notes, but I don't read anything. So that was a nice surprise. I really appreciate that, Greg. It wasn't the best birthday because I was sick. But um, yeah, I did not have any cake. I think I did have, I did have some, not Pepsi, but I had some donuts and uh, ginger ale because there was some nausea happening as well. It's a super fun week. Greg goes on to say, I like this episode because it stands alone amongst the season so far. There is no mention of George's engagement or Elaine's job at Peterman or even the maestro. Everything is fresh and I like how that plays. It probably has to do with Larry David exiting the show. Ah, uh, interesting. Yes. No, that that's really great to point out. I, I've kind of established already this isn't my favorite episode. I'm not a fan of the plots, but it is nice to get a break from George's engagement. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we don't even mention other stuff going on. It is very standalone. I agree with that. I'm just not sure if I love everything that it entails. Now, Larry David still works on the show during this season. I think he exits after this season. But this is the first episode of the season that Larry David hasn't written. And it is very obvious. All right. Next in Greg's sack lunch, I find his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. 
He says, I love Elaine's opening scene where the wake up guy calls and flirts with her. Her sleep acting is great. And then the shift she makes after the voice on the other end of the phone implies that she had a hot date because of her sexy voice. Did people used to get wake up calls at their homes back then? Was this a thing? Oh, God, I wonder. Oh, yeah, no, first of all, you're you're dead on with the sleep acting. Like every time she stretches, like I want to stretch, like it's really convincing. <laughs> I totally believe that Elaine had just woken up. So yeah, great sleep acting by Miss JLD. Um, I feel like it might have been a thing. Like maybe maybe what I don't I don't know where alarm clocks were at this point. Um in fact the next episode revolves around an alarm clock. And one that she supposedly has had since she and Jerry were dating. So <laughs> I guess, too, this is why this episode kind of bothers me as well. Because along with certain characteristics not tracking with the characters, I just like an alarm clock. Like <laughs> we, in the next episode, we hear about her alarm clock. So anyway, again, these are things not to get bogged down about, especially about a show like Seinfeld. But this is what nerds like me do. Next, Greg says, I love the big few Elaine does when she meets her blind date. It is superficial of her somewhat to care about what he would look like given that she was already interested, but I love that she's not afraid to show him that she's already relieved that he's good looking enough. It's more realistic because you would hope for the best in this situation. Yeah, you know, I think he looked nervous when he walked in, so I don't know. I feel like she does the few motion, which, yeah, I mean, like... <laughs> I think it's kind of she's doing it for both of them because I think she can tell, OK, he's giving me a big smile. We're both attracted to each other. Thank God, because this this was a risky situation. <laughs> Greg goes on to say Elaine shows some incredible foot acting when she wakes up James while they're sleeping together. That toe flaring here is Emmy caliber. Hang on, Greg. Are you a foot fetishist? I didn't even notice the toe flaring. <laughs> no, actually, I did. Yeah, you're right. That is good foot acting. But I feel like someone who like is into feet would notice that more. So I'm just putting that on you, Greg, and accusing you of that. <laughs> it's probably not fair. <laughs> But uh, yeah, good foot acting and I'm going to have to watch again. Let's everyone, all of us, let's watch for the toe flaring that Greg is super turned on by. Let's just, let's just watch that. All right. Next in Greg's sack is his scene swap idea. He says, Jerry's story with the carnivorous Holly is only salvaged by the fact that Elaine is so involved and it crosses over into her story with the new guy. I would have liked to have gotten more out of this dynamic. Elaine setting Jerry, her ex, up with a relative should have been a bigger deal and more of a point of conversation, but they chose to focus on the mutton. It all works and Elaine gets a lot in this episode, but I just think that was an idea that was overlooked. Yeah, it looks like we're, we don't agree on this episode, which is fine, Greg. We're allowed to disagree. I've said that before. But you bring up something really interesting. Yeah, I, I would have loved to see more of that kind of how, how is this okay that you're setting him up with a relative? Like, I can't imagine setting up an ex-boyfriend with like someone I'm related to. I mean, I know that they're so platonic and there's nothing even remotely romantic with them at this point, which I love, but it does seem weird. I, like I said before, it just seems like all there's so many just kind of out of the blue things that come up in this episode from Holly herself to some of the attitudes that are expressed. It just... Ugh. Like you said, Greg, it is a kind of a standalone episode, but I just don't think a lot of what is in this is earned. So for me, I don't think it all works, but I do like that Elaine gets a good amount in this episode. Yeah, she gets to cross over a couple of storylines, but I will in a little bit express what I wish that was instead. Finally, Greg's extra thoughts in his sack. He says, Pulp can move, baby, is one of the lines from the show I've said the most in real life. Not even in pulp context. I just randomly say it because it cracks me up. Oh, it's a great line. And it's it's so oh, just fantastically delivered by Jason Alexander. Just the anger with which it's said it just makes it that much funnier. He says, Elaine's cousin needs to chill out. Why is she so obsessive about meat and mima? <laughs> meat and mima. <laughs> She'll probably have a heart attack at 40. Eat lettuce for once, lady. <sighs> yeah, I, I don't I don't need to go into it again. But this fucking Holly, man, like 
okay, we get it. You like meat and you're also like super basic with old lady decor. So get off your high horse. And lastly, Greg says, why is Kramer allowed to be alone in a hospital room? Not once, but twice with this sickly boy. Where are his parents? (laughs) Oh my God. Absolutely. I've wondered this ever since this episode came out. I'm like, all right, this kid's dad buys him this card what he's just like fling it at him and he's like see you kid (laughs) like where are these kids parents and yeah who is this rando like if anything I think the hospital staff would be like who is this why are you here (laughs) but once again just like the whole grapefruit pulp juice in his eye is gonna make George totally wink like a weirdo um, and also, let's not forget, George wears glasses. Why, how did this juice get past the, his glasses lens? It's just it's just not for me. Um, but yeah, no, that's a great point, Greg. Where are Bobby's parents? Thank you so much, Greg, for your thoughts and for the birthday wishes. I so appreciate that. Now I will close Greg's sack lunch. All right, moving on to my favorite Elaine moments. I love that first scene. I love her sleep acting. And then I love that switch into her sexy nighty Elaine. James. A close second is kicking James in the face. Not for the reasons of like, it turns me on like with Greg. Clearly it turned Greg on. But um, no, it for me, it's just more funny than a turn on like, like Greg. I mean, Greg is totally a foot fetishist. Um, Let's get that going. But yeah, I love that scene as well. I love the kicking in the face. Like, (laughs) I just can't help but think, (laughs) did she know this guy at all? Like, you know, sometimes you don't know actors might know each other. They feel comfortable doing that. But um, what if they just met that day and she's got to put her feet in his face? I mean, (laughs) this is what actors do. And it kind of reminds me, I had a callback today for, oh, fingers crossed. It's a really good job. I hope I get it. But my first in-person callback in so long, and I was paired up with a man who was supposed to play my husband, and I went all in. I was really like, I was hugging it up with him, acting all lovey-dovey, <laughs> to the point where after we, when we were walking out, we were done. I said, man, I'm sorry. I went all in for it. He's like, no, no, no. I loved it. It was great. Like It actually relaxed me because I, you know, I never know if it's okay to like when you're playing a husband and wife. And I was like, no, I just went for it. So anyway, I groped a man today and um, hopefully it gets me a job. All right, moving on to my final notes for the episode. <sighs> this is a silly episode. I'm not going to discount that there's definitely silly moments, really funny moments too. But I'm just not a fan of any of the storylines, <laughs> except for Elaine dating the wake up guy. I do like that. I feel like we could have totally swapped out all of the stupid Holly meat eater crap uh, for more of Elaine dating her wake up guy. That actor is so cute and funny. Um, there could have just been so much more, especially with the dogs and the Elaine's past with the dog napping. You know, we already did the callback. But I just feel like I would have liked to see that that dynamic more. Maybe his job as a wake-up guy is interfering with the relationship. I don't know, but I just could have had Holly lifted out of this episode completely. Now, Tom Gamble and Max Pross, you know, they're the writing team who wrote this episode, and their episodes in the series are always a bit sillier, and I don't mind silly. I do not mind silly. I I love silly. I incorporate silliness into my everyday uh, existence, but I don't like the silly if it doesn't track with the characters. And this is what bugs me about this episode, mainly with Jerry and the whole manly eating thing. I mean, I just don't see Jerry caring that much. I think it would be a turnoff for him being like, all right, she wants me to keep eating meat. I'm done. You know, like Jerry, like like Elaine says, Jerry, you break up with a girl every week. Like, (laughs) what the hell? I could see this more for George, who's so insecure and, you know, needs the approval of women and stuff like that. So like, I just, yeah, fundamentally, I just don't think Jerry would act this way for a woman in general, and especially a basic bitch like Holly. And I think that's all I can say about the wink. Thank you for your patience. I know this episode is coming out later than usual, but I needed to recover. And luckily, I'm pretty much there. Please be sure to follow Hot and Heavy on social media. On Instagram, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. On TikTok, at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you'd like to email me any thoughts, please do at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. 
Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.